the book of Deuteronomy chapter 7. Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 1. The Lord your God will lead you. The Lord your God will lead you into the land that you are entering to take for your own. He will force out many nations for you. The Hittites, the Girgashites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. Seven nations greater and more powerful than you. The Lord your God will put these nations under your power. And you will defeat them. You must destroy them completely. Don't make an agreement with them or show them mercy. Don't marry any of them. And don't let your sons or daughters marry any of the people from those other nations. If you do, they will turn your children away from following me. Then your children will serve other gods. And the Lord will be very angry with you. He will quickly destroy you. This is what you must do to those nations. You must smash their altars and break their memorial stones into pieces. Cut down their Asherah poles and burn their statues. Do this because you are the Lord's own people. From all the people on the earth, the Lord your God chose you to be his special people. People who belong only to to him hallelujah i think you should take that verse six as your own from all the people on the earth the lord your god chose you to be his special people people who belong only to him hallelujah i belong to jesus i don't care what anybody wants to say i belong to jesus you belong to jesus hallelujah now, one of the things that we see in this passage in Deuteronomy chapter 7 is that Israel had to deal with a set of people that were greater, more organized, more powerful. They had organized armies. They had cities they had government structures in place and some of these nations if not all of them they had giants that were present in their midst almost all the time when we are going to possess something we have to deal with some kind of giant in our way some kind of issue problem spirit person that is trying to restrict us from acquiring what god wants us to acquire when you talk about a giant you're talking about a person or a spirit with great size or force, very large, very strong, very difficult, and very powerful. You're talking about a circumstance that might be reminiscent of all that I have described right there. This giant many times has rulership in the territory that they are in. And they are intimidating. They use the power of intimidation against us, which is the spirit of fear that they want to use to cripple us. Giants can be menacing, monstrous, terrifying, frightening. They can be domineering they can be 
tyrannical. And guess what? Even though they may be huge, even though the giants may be big and massive, they are not bigger than our God. This is the first thing you need to put in your mind. They are not bigger than our God. The problem with us is that because we are visual people and we operate by the senses and there is nothing wrong with that. We have been given the senses by God. You can't tell us to throw away the senses. No. But we must learn to control them. So that when the spirit realm begins to interact with us. We are not crippled in this realm, in this sphere. The natural because of what is happening in the spirit. And that is why we have to arm ourselves with spiritual revelation and wisdom and knowledge so that when we begin to interact with the spirit realm, we are not defeated by what is inside there. We have an advantage please understand we are created in the image of God we can interact with both the natural and the spiritual realm at the same time we can for the enemy to interact with the natural realm he needs your cooperation in order to do that. And the way he gets your cooperation. Is to get you. To agree. With whatever it is. That he is saying. Insinuating. Implying. Or whatever it is. That he is. Pushing towards you. He wants you to agree with him. But you. In order for you to interact with the spirit realm, all you have to agree with is the word of God. Just agree with the word of God. And you have mastered already what is going on in the spirit realm. And so there are some things that you have to believe about yourself. And about God. You must believe that God. Is bigger. More powerful. Greater. Mightier. Than anything that exists out there. There is no power. That is bigger than him. None. The reason why some of us feel. As if. Things are. Difficult. It is because sometimes God does not respond immediately or the way we would want him to respond. But I have learned something about God and his operations in dealing with enemies. He will allow them to reach the zenith of their power, the zenith of their ability. And then when they have reached to the extent of their extremities, he steps in and use one small thing and pull them down. Don't let the giants scare you because of the sound of their voice or the magnitude of their size. Mm -mm. Whenever they reach the zenith of their power, 
God is going to pull them down. It's as if God wants them to reach the pinnacle of their pride before he hits at them and tear them down. That's what happened to Goliath. That's what happened to the Amorites. Because the Bible said that it was when the iniquity of the Amorites was full. That Israel now, God began to do some things in Israel to deliver them from Egypt. Can you imagine that? He waited for 400 years for them to reach the pinnacle of their wickedness and of their iniquity in order to do something about them. Don't be afraid. Don't be befuzzled in your mind when you see wickedness rising the way it is rising. Just know this one thing. God will allow them to rise until they reach the pinnacle of their evil and then pull them down because he is the most high. Hallelujah. I want to take you to understanding some things tonight. Joshua was the one that was able, that was sent by God with the ability to take Canaan, Canaan land, which is that promised land that was given to Israel. Joshua means Jehovah is my salvation. It simply means this. There are some things that you cannot possess if you're not saved. Hmm. Let me say it again. There are some things you cannot possess if you're not saved. Salvation is a prerequisite to possessing Canaan. Can I say it again? Salvation is a prerequisite to possessing Canaan. That's why it is wrong for any one of us to bring a sinner into spiritual warfare, into dealing with spiritual matters in which they have no jurisdiction to deal with. It is wrong to pray prayers of deliverance for an individual who is not saved because when you do that, you are setting them up for bigger destruction because they have no jurisdiction, no angelic backing, no governmental authority from heaven to possess nor secure nor hold on to whatever it is that they are seeking to possess in a spiritual manner. This is why you find some people, they will go the other side. They will go to the dark side to seek possession because they do not want to face the backlashing of the forces and powers that will come against them if they try to take possession of things that these spirits and powers and their agents occupy. This is why they go over into the dark world to make allegiance and to make covenant so that they could be okay with them while they're possessing. But in the realm of the kingdom of the children of God, in order for us to take what is ours, we have to come through the gate of salvation. If we don't, the backlash 
is going to be wicked. The backlash is going to be cruel. Because the enemy will not give up what he holds on to without a fight. And this is why spiritual warfare will not stop until the Lord Jesus Christ restores all things unto himself. There are some things we are going to have to fight for. And there are some spirits we're going to have to fight against. And there are some agents we're going to have to confront in order to take what belongs to us. Because the truth is that many of us have been displaced. Displaced by so many different things. Maybe the displacement didn't happen in our time. Maybe it happened in the time of our forefathers. And we have been displaced. And we now are trying to come back into prosperity. Come back into possession. Come back into ownership. And you realize that, hey, we, 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 we can't do this if we do not become offensive. If we do not become confrontational. If we do not become aggressive to take what belongs to us. We can't sit down and just be passive like that. There are some things we just have to go into battle. And one of the things that baffles me is that there are some Christians who believe that you don't have to fight. You can just sit down and just turn the other cheek all the time. No, there's a time to turn the cheek and there's a time to lift up the sword. When your possession is in the hand of the enemy, this is not time to turn cheek. Let me say it again. I said, when your possession is in the hand of the enemy, this is not the time to turn cheek. Mm -mm. It's not. Your possession is in his hand. This is time for war. This is time to recover. This is time to take back. And so you cannot be sitting down there and say, oh, Jesus said we should turn the cheek. Don't misinterpret Jesus. Don't misinterpret what he said. Put things in proper context. This is not time to turn cheek. It is time to lift up the sword. What sword are you lifting up? The one that fights against principalities and powers, rulers of darkness, spirits of wickedness in high places, thrones, dominions, authorities. This is the time to fight. And these are the powers that we fight against. Now, every nation that you confront, every spirit that you confront, you cannot confront them with the same strategy that you have used with the one prayer to this one. No. Everyone requires a different battle, a different understanding a different set of instructions. But you know what some of us have done is that we have become so demon focused that we are paranoid about every kind of spirit. And we want to know this spirit name and that spirit name and what this spirit does and that. No, don't become paranoid. You're not paranoid. Mm -mm. You are led by the Lord, your God, who is your salvation. If God is leading you, you don't have to be paranoid. People who are not led by God, they have confusion 
going on. They are filled with anxiety. They are filled with spiritual paranoia. And you find that some Christians, they want to go here, they want to go there, they want to go everywhere, everywhere that some spirit is being mentioned to be cast out. They find themselves there. It's paranoia. No. You must stand in the reality of who you are as a child of God. In fact, can I tell you something? You don't need any oil to cast out any demon. What you need is the authority of Jesus Christ. And a solid understanding and belief in his word. We have become so paranoid that we forget that Jehovah is our salvation. And that he is the one that leads us. Not oil, not water, not cloth, and not whatever else that people use to make themselves look spiritual. What we need or who we need is the Holy Spirit. So in this season, we are dependent on what? Instructions from heaven. And this is why we have to learn to pray and to spend time in the presence of God so that we can hear him for ourselves. So that we can hear him for our personal lives. So pray about everything you want to do. Pray about everything you want to possess. And prayer is not about the length of time. Prayer is about the sincerity of your heart. And the simplicity of your request. Some of us, we talk to God as if we are quarreling. <laughs> We talk to God as if we are fighting him. Mm -mm. Humility, simplicity, sincerity of heart. And we go before him. But you know what has happened to some of us is that the channels of our spirit are not opened. They are clogged. What are the channels of our spirit? Our heart to discern. Our mind to understand. Our eyes to see. Our ears to hear. Our emotions to feel. Those channels are clogged up. And that is why many times we, we don't hear him. Sense him. Feel him. Yes. You can feel God. You can feel his presence. You can see him. You can hear him. You can understand him through his word, through the revelation of his word. But because we are so clogged, we're not hearing instructions. We're not tapping into instructions for our destiny, for our possessions. Because there are too many things clogging us. And this is where the length of time comes in now with prayer. The frequency and the length of time in prayer in the place and presence of God, it will unplug your channels. It will open your channels up so that you can connect to him to hear the instructions for the possession, for the possessing of your possessions. So we have to pray. Pray. So that we know what God wants to do 
and the way that God wants it done. You read the story of Joshua and you will see every battle that Joshua goes into. There are different sets of instructions that are given. Different sets of instructions that Joshua has to follow. But you see, we read the scriptures and we come out with our own mentalities. For example, you some people will read the Jericho story and immediately they get a revelation that they should walk around their church seven times. What are you walking around your church seven times to do? To tear it down? <laughs> that's, that's not what that means. It means that we must listen to God for the foolish instruction that will defeat the big problems in our life. What foolish thing will God tell you to do? You have to listen. Didn't send you to go walk around the church after the church is not Jericho wall. Mm -mm. If he tells you to walk around something, it must be your problem, not the church. We have to learn to listen to God. Now, in Joshua chapter 7, there are seven nations. I want to deal with nation number one tonight. The Hittite nation. The Hittites, and, and I'm dealing with this as a spirit. The Hittites, they were people who inhabited the mountains that were south of the promised land. Or south in the promised land. They were descendants of Heth. I want you to listen very carefully what I'm saying. Heth. H-E-T-H, is the fourth son of Canaan. Canaan is the son of Ham. Ham is the son of Noah. Giving you the paternity. Heth, the fourth son of Canaan. Canaan, the son of Ham. Ham, the son of Noah. The Bible said Ham was the son who uncovered his father's nakedness. And because of what he did, he br it brought a curse upon the bloodline of Canaan. Not the bloodline of Ham. I want you to get that very straight. Because some people use this to say that the black people, the black race is cursed. No, it's not the black race that was cursed. It was Canaan. Read Genesis chapter 9 and verse 22. It says, Ham, the father of Canaan, saw that his father was naked. Well, let me read King James because that translation is not correct. Verse 22. Saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. Verse 24. And Noah awoke from his wine. Well, let me read 23 because I'm going to say some things. And Shem and Japhet took a garment and laid it upon their shoulders and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were backward and they saw not their father's nakedness. And Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him. And he said, cursed be Canaan. A servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. And he said, blessed be the Lord God of Shem. And Canaan shall be his servant. God shall enlarge Japheth and shall dwell in the tents of Shem. And Canaan shall be his servant. Hmm. And Noah lived 350 years after the flood. Now, 
you listen to this story and you are wondering what is going on here. I'm going to mention some things to you. Please just follow me. I'm uncovering some things tonight. The Bible used a term. Uncovered the nakedness of his father or saw the nakedness of his father. What is that? What does it mean to uncover one's nakedness? I have come to realize that this is a euphemism in the Bible. That means you had sex with someone that belongs to that particular individual whose nakedness you uncovered. How did I get this interpretation? Leviticus chapter 18 and verse 6 to 16. You can read it. Verse 6 says, None of you shall approach to any that is near of kin to him to uncover their nakedness. I am the Lord. The nakedness of thy father or the nakedness of thy mother shalt thou not uncover. She is thy mother. Thou shalt not uncover her nakedness. The nakedness of thy father's wife you will not uncover. It is thy father's nakedness. Now I want you to pay attention to that. The nakedness of your father's wife is his nakedness. Now let's go a little bit further. To uncover your father's nakedness is not to see your father naked. <laughs> but it is to see his wife naked. And then go a bit further to sleep with her. Her nakedness is his nakedness. His nakedness is her nakedness. And so what happened to Noah? There are three theories that exist out there. Number one. People say that Ham literally saw his father naked. How could that bring such a devastating curse? Mm -hmm. Number two, Ham sodomized his father. Well, what does that have to do with Canaan? It was Ham. If that's the case, then it is Ham. Who should have been cursed. And every child. That was born through Ham. Why Canaan only? Why was he singled out? And number three. Which is. The one I lean to. Because of. The euphemism in the Bible. A euphemism is where the Bible uses. More palatable language. To describe something that is. Uh, deadly, egregious, nasty. The Bible covers it up with palatable language, so to speak. So the third one is that Ham slept with his father's wife, who happened to be not his mother, and produced a son which he named Canaan. This would have deprived Noah of a fourth son because he only had three, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And so Noah, having got up from his wine, knew what his son did in impregnating the lady. Now, some of you might be saying, Prophet, where are you getting all of this? Just hold your asses and just follow me very carefully. I want you to understand something. And Noah saw that this boy impregnated his wife and deprived him of that opportunity of getting another child. He now cursed the child 
that came out of that union, which happened to be Canaan, the fourth son of Ham. If you look at what the Bible said, Noah lived 350 years after coming out of the ark. That's enough time for Noah to get a child. Well, it seemed as if Noah did not touch his wife after that incident. Don't know how long it took for that to happen, but it seemed as if he did not touch her after that because of what Ham did. And so Canaan now uh, became the product of a union that was cursed. And Canaan now occupied a territory that was not given to him, but was given to Shem. He was supposed to go into the African region with his father, but he didn't. Instead, he stayed in that portion that belonged to Shem. And you can look at the things that transpired in that region through this child that came. The biggest issue was sexual immorality. That this spirit followed this nation and the nations that came out from Canaan and that joined with Canaan. Whatever the case may be, and whatever you want to believe theologically about this issue, something happened that opened up a floodgate of demonic infiltration into the life of this child. And from there, remember what we're talking about, Heth, the fourth son of Canaan. He is from that bloodline. And it's the Hittites that came out of that bloodline. Now the Hittite means sons of terror. I gave you the foundation just so you can understand what the foundation of this spirit is and how this spirit attached to the Hittites and become known for what they were known for. Hittites, Hittite means sons of terror. And what do they represent? They represent spirits of subliminal torments and fears, deceits, phobias, depression. The word terror refers to an extreme manifestation of fear. And is always related to an element of mystery. People are fearful of what they don't know or what they don't understand. For example, you may be afraid of a live wire because you know that enough electricity is running through it to hurt you if you touch it. But that don't con constitute terror. That's just fear because you know what is present. Terror is when you're walking down a dark alley at night and you don't know if someone is about to come out of the dark and attack you. So you're walking, but you are terrified of what may happen because of the dark. It may happen, it may not happen, but you are terrified because you believe that it is going to happen. Terror is when you have heard that a serial killer has been attacking your neighborhood and you don't know if your house is the next target. So what do you do? You go out and you put up all kinds of cameras and you put up burglar bars and you come in before six o'clock and you buy a firearm and all kinds of stuff. 
because you're terrified. Terror is related to the unknown. It has to do with things that you cannot see with your eyes, but you are imagining with your mind. What the Hittite spirit does is that it attacks your emotions. If you are not in control of your emotions, if you do not submit those emotions to the Holy Spirit and submit your emotions to the truth of God's word, you are opening up yourself to the Hittite spirit. Now, I'm not dealing with the, the nation. I'm dealing with the spirit. I'm just using this term to describe the spirit. Emotions are strongly connected to the prophetic. If you don't bring your emotions in check and control your emotions, you will have a problem connecting to the prophetic realm. What will happen is that your emotions will connect to the spirit realm, but it will not be the third heavens. It will be the second heavens. And the devil will do things, will show you stuff in your dreams while you are awake because your emotions are connected to the second heavens. A lot of times, and I want you to hear me, there are dreams that you have, terrifying dreams, frightening dreams, horror dreams, and you, you are scared because of those dreams. What's going on? There is a fear in you that the enemy is connecting to. There is something in you that the enemy found gateway to further torment you in your dreams. And it can manifest in life as well. The Hittite spirit attacks your destiny, your calling. It attacks your ability to act Acquire that which will change your life and your destiny for good. It invokes fear so that you cannot operate in faith. There is no fear in faith and there is no faith in fear. There is none. What the enemy is after is your faith because it is through faith that you are going to acquire your possessions through faith now faith my friend is not what you desire <laughs> some people believe faith is what you desire no it's not what you desire faith is what the lord tells you Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word. Faith is what the Lord shows you. What you hear and what you see becomes the substance you're going to acquire. That substance that you're going to acquire might exist in reality or it might not yet exist in reality. Whichever, which, whichever way it goes, your faith and acting on that faith because of what God said and what God showed will allow you to acquire. And so you can understand Joshua's relentless pursuit. Why? Because he heard God. God showed him also 
the land. He was one of the 12 that went into the land and spied out the land. I think for 40 days, they were inside there, moving up and down in it. So he saw it and he also heard God. So you can just imagine that this man was not afraid of anything he saw. Because one who was the most high spoke to him. Now, as a spirit of terror, what the Hittite spirit does is that it spreads panic in the hearts of individuals. Because it will begin to show itself through its agents that are in the land, through the systems that it has set up, through the structures that it has built. And it will make you now look at those things and see those things as gigantic, as impossible to either defeat conquer or take and so if you do not have a clear connection with the Lord whether visually or instructively when you now encounter Hittite you're going to run this spirit projects fear through threats, nightmares, and deep emotional despair. Usually when there is a prophetic mandate upon your life, what this spirit will do is that it rises up to drive fear and despair into your heart so that you'll remain silent. You'll remain paralyzed. The first thing to acquire what God is giving to you is not to run into it, to grab it. No, is to begin to speak. That land is mine. That building is mine. That territory is mine. I'm not talking about going, naming and claiming what God didn't give you. Mm -mm. I'm talking about what God has given to you. What he has shown you in your heart, in your spirit. What he has said to you in your ears. You begin to speak. You begin to prophesy. You begin to declare. You have to rise out of the emotional despair that the enemy has put you in. Emotions is a natural thing. It's natural. It's natural to feel frustrated. It's natural to feel angry. It's natural to feel certain things. But you cannot remain there. If your revelation of your destiny is not greater than your revelation of your present circumstance, you will be trapped in the feelings of your emotions concerning where you are now. The revelation of your destiny the revelation of your possessions must be greater than what you are going through, feeling now. This is why you have to spend time to hear God. How do you spend time to hear God? Number of things you can do. One, be where the word of God is. Is being taught in truth. That's the first thing. Number two. 
Be in the presence of God in worship. Three, be in the place of prayer. Number four, be around people of faith. People who speak faith. People who are positive. Not negativity. When you do these things, you're remaining in the place of the presence to open up those channels so that you can hear. And it will affect your emotions. It will affect you. Do you know why Joshua and Caleb were different? Let me tell you one reason. Joshua, every time Moses took a journey to go into the presence of God, Joshua went with him. The only reason why Joshua did not go at the top of the mountain was because God said he could not come up there. But you know where Joshua was? On the mountain waiting for Moses. So as Moses was up there fasting, Joshua was down there waiting. It was a type of fast too. He was waiting on the presence of the prophet to come back. With the word of God. And so you can imagine. That the first person. That Moses would relay. What God told him was Joshua. How many of you. Oh my God. Are willing to wait. On the word of God. To come to you. How many of you are willing to wait. On your man of God. To hear from God concerning you. Some of you are too eager. You're too quick to run. Because you have no patience to wait. To hear what God has to say. Because you think time is going on your life. Time is not going on your life. God controls time. God controls time. <laughs> the days are coming back when Christians will live 120 years. The days are coming when we will live long upon the face of the earth because of what God wants to do in us and the levels of glory that he wants to manifest. So don't worry about time. Just wait on him so that you can have a different spirit. Many of us are trying to take our possessions with the same spirit, the same mentality. No, we need a different spirit. And when I say a different spirit, I'm talking about a different mentality. Different level of emotion. God bless those who have gone before us. I thank God for them. I thank God for the work they have done. And the legacies that they have left. But hear me brethren. Hear me. If we are going to see. The greatness of our God. Manifest in this our generation. We need a different spirit. We need a whole different encounter. We bless God for the generals that are out there presently. But truth be told. We need a different. A whole different experience. They have been doing church, but God wants us to do kingdom. It's a whole different ball game. For us to possess what God wants us to possess, we need a different spirit. So you can just, just understand 
how Joshua grabbed hold of what was in the spirit of Moses. It was God who took him on the mountaintop and showed him all kinds of stuff. Told him all kinds of things. Moses didn't dream up these things. He didn't, he didn't go up there and think, say, okay, today I'm going to write this and tomorrow I'm going to write that. No, God spoke to him word for word, letter for letter, comma for comma. And he wrote what God said. And he would come down. The first person he encountered was Joshua. You can just imagine the, the impartation that took place. In that man. Hallelujah. My God. And so what the enemy wants to do brethren. He wants to silence your prophetic. <clears throat> That's what the Hittite spirit wants to do. He wants to silence your prophetic ability. Your prophetic inclination. Your prophetic acumen. The moment your emotions are affected. Ah, the prof your ability to connect to the prophetic realm becomes affected. Your emotions are tied. It's like it's, it's a gateway to the prophetic. You don't believe me? Look at the prophets in the Bible. When they are angry, some serious things happen. When they are happy, some serious things happen. Just go and look. Happy or angry, look at the results. Sad and frustrated, look at the results. Emotions tied to the prophetic. Now, As a spirit of terror, what this Hittite spirit does is that it loves to remain in the dark and prey on you. That is how gangs operate. They stay in the dark and do things against you. So here are a few things I want to you to learn tonight in dealing with this spirit. Number one, deal with your emotional problems. Deal with your emotional problems. Some of you need therapy. Therapy can help some of you. Or some of you need deliverance. Mm. Those are two different things. Therapy comes through uh, counseling. But there are some things that must be cast out. Some things must be cast out of you. Some of you are too angry. Some of you are too sensitive. Some of you are carrying problems from your third ex-boyfriend or your third ex-girlfriend. You need help. Deal with your emotional problems. If you don't deal with this, the Hittite spirit will control you. Some of you don't trust. You trust no one. You can't live like that. That's not any way for anybody to live. You can't love. You don't have peace 
always flustered and frustrated and annoyed. You have an emotional problem. And some, some of you are passing off these emotional problems as spiritual manifestations in the church. Mm -hmm. We come to some leaders in the church. You can't talk to them. And when I say talk to them, I don't mean going to them angrily. I don't mean disrespecting them. I mean, you simply cannot go to them to say, look, I'm feeling this way. This is what is affecting me. I don't understand this. The moment you do that is problem. You realize that issues that wasn't even yours start becoming yours. You start realizing that the brother that left 10 years ago and what he did to her or to him, to that leader, now becomes the weapon that is used against you. Emotional problems. You hear it in the way they preach. You hear it in the way they teach. You see it in the way they lead. Emotional hurts. Perpetuated by what? Hittite spirit. So we, we have church hurts. Abuses within families and relationships. Fears and depressions and things like these. We have to deal with our emotional problems. You cannot take Canaan with emotional baggage. Ah. Canaan for you might be marriage. Canaan for somebody else might be a business. Canaan for somebody else might be their educational pursuits. Canaan for somebody else might be a house or a property. Canaan is simply what God wants you to possess. And the truth is that if we have emotional problems, we cannot possess our Canaan. We have to deal with our emotional problems first. So if it is counseling you need, ask God to send you the right counselor. If it's therapy you need, ask God to send you the right therapist. If it's deliverance you need, ask God to deliver you. Mm. Yes. Mighty God of God. Jacob had an emotional problem. He was afraid of his brother. God had to send an angel to deal with Jacob's emotional issues. The man had such serious emotional problem that he fought with an angel. Can you imagine that? Some of you are so emotionally messed up that you're fighting with God and don't even realize. Mm. And except God break your hip and lick two ribs out of socket, you won't stop. No, deal with your emotional problem. You must acknowledge, hey, look, I have an issue here. There are some emotional issues that I'm struggling with and I need to deal with this. I need to. Don't think you can possess your possessions if you're not emotionally stable. If you're not emotionally stable, you will kill your friend and think it's your enemy. You will drive away your destiny helpers thinking that they came to destroy you. <laughs> mm. 
you will destroy your bridge thinking that this is an obstacle. You will fight angels thinking that these are demons. That's what emotional problems do to you. You're not able to think clearly. Come on, let's deal with our emotional problems so that this Hittite power can be broken from our lives. Number two. One of the things that Hittite spirit does is that it causes religious segregation, factions among believers, factions among the church community. Why? Because of fear. Remember what this Hittite spirit is. It's a spirit of terror. It's a spirit of fear. When people are afraid, when people are fearful, fearful because of things that happened to them in the past, fearful because they don't understand who this brother or who this sister is. You see all kinds of factions and segregations start happening. Cliques. Start building. We must stand against that. Fearful of this one's anointing. Fearful of that, that one's gift. Fearful of that one's grace. I don't want him to come into my church. Because he's going to draw away members from me. Listen. If somebody comes in your midst. And then after coming in your midst. Somebody else begin to follow them. Glory be to God. They were not meant to be with you. Simple. They were not meant to be with you. So wish them all the best. Give them a coat or two. And a bottle of water. And help them. To go on their merry way. You don't know that some people need to live your life. In order for 10 more to come. Don't worry about those things. What we must stand against. Is segregation. Religious factions. Among ourselves. Number three. Hittite spirit fosters rumors, gossip, and tail bearing. Why? Fear. When people are fearful of what they don't know, what they don't understand, or what they don't like, they will start gossiping, they will start tail bearing, they will start spreading rumors. And what this does is that it breeds mistrust, it breeds skepticism, it breeds suspicion among people. <laughs> oh my God. Let's rebuke that from out of our midst and out of our lives. We come into the church community number four. And we have, believe it or not, spiritual gangs operating within churches and church communities. Spiritual gangs. I'm telling you. I am for this prophet. I'm for that prophet. I'm for this man of God. I'm for that man of God. And if my man of God don't teach that, I will not receive it. If your man of God don't teach it or say it, you will not receive it. As if to say we are not from the same kingdom. Hmm. 
spiritual gangs. This one believes that they are better than that one. That one believes that because what they are doing is what God wants them to do. So everybody else must do the same thing. Ah, And they try to destroy what you are doing or belittle it. Mm -mm. You see, you might have an acre of land that God has given you to plant and to farm. And you're growing your trees and they're bearing fruit. And all I have is one potted plant that bears two and three tomatoes in season. Take care of your acre and leave me. Let me take care of my pot. What, 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 what the gang's for? Aren't we belonging to the same master? Do, do we not belong to the same God, to the same Lord? But you have a tree, a, a, a field of trees, or one potted plant. What's the difference? Who gave you the farm? Who gave you the plot of land? Isn't it the same Lord that gave me my one little pot? Take care of your own, I'll take care of mine. And if I have time, I come and help you take care of yours. These gangs, spiritual gangs, praying thunder fire on each other's head before we look for the enemy and give him a couple slaps together. Number five, what the Hittite spirit does is that it fights against the prophetic ministry in the church. And by the grace of God, I'll be, I'll be teaching on this, the prophetic ministry, so that you understand that the prophetic ministry is not about telling you um, things about your past. There is greater depths and dimensions to the prophetic ministry. Some of you are just stuck in the realm of soothsaying. We must encourage and facilitate the prophetic ministry in the church because this is one of the swords that will fight the Hittite spirit. One of the other big things we must deal with is sexual immorality. Remember, the Hittite spirit is rooted. Its foundation is rooted in sexual immorality. And so every form of sexual immorality, we must teach against it. We must rebuke it. And we must restore those who have fallen because of it. Gone are the days when we shame people because of their mistakes. Gone are the days when we look down on people. Because of their sins. Gone are those days. Those were the days of ignorance. Those were the days of darkness. We must be in a position now. To act maturely. So that we can restore people. From the clutches. Of the Hittite foundation. And number seven. Because of fear. And because people gang up against each other and gang up against you and spread rumors and spread gossip and talk bad and have emotional problems and all of these issues. You know what it breeds among us? Dishonor. We must cultivate a culture of honor. 
you must develop a spirit of honor. Nobody is greater or more deserving than the other. Mm -hmm. We are all servants of Jesus with different assignments. We don't have to be fearful of each other. And we don't have to attack each other's assignment. No. We don't have to try to destroy another person's assignment because we want them to be a part of ours. Oh, no. Oh, no. And not every believer will get a singular assignment. Some will be called out. And those who are called out, others will be called to join them. Because of the calling and grace and gift of God on your life. Look at David's life. David was running from Saul. Broken, busted and disgusted. Who were the people that joined him? Those were in, who were in debt. Those who were discontented and those who were distressed. And what became of them? They became the mighty men of David. The mighty men of David. That's what they became. Men like Joab was a part of that clan. Amasa. Generals. Captains over hundreds and fifties and thousands. If you don't find your proper alignment you will not fulfill your assignment cultivate honor amongst us it will block the Hittite spirit from attacking our hearts from attacking our minds from attacking our emotions So here are some things that we need to do. One, don't be afraid of counseling. Some of us are afraid of counseling. We don't seek counsel to help us. Listen, every one of us at some point in time in our life, we need counsel. We need to go through counseling. Don't be afraid of counsel. In the mount multitude of counselors, there is safety. Some of us need help to deal with our emotional struggles. The Hittite spirit has so taken over our lives that it is so intertwined with the hearts of people that they become untrusting of everybody. No. We have to find a way and that way is Jesus to heal the emotional wounds, the emotional hurts, the emotional pains, the fears that we feel so that we can be ready emotionally, mentally to take our possessions. Don't allow the Hittite spirit to destroy you. Go into your foundation. Root out fear out of your life. Get rid of it. Through prayer. Through faith. 
and allow God to empower you with his spirit so that you can possess your possessions. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Jesus.